Hi, my name is Sheldon Livesey. I'm the director for of One Accord Ministry, and we're going to be talking about an exciting message today. The title is What Opened the Tomb and What the Tomb Opened. Over the last few weeks, we want to do a little bit of review. I believe we've looked at some of the most uh, powerful messages that come out of Scripture, and those messages reflect literally on part of Jesus last week here on this earth. If you think about all the things that he has gone through, we looked one week on how he came, we'll, ref, we'll review this in a minute too, how he came, one, to agitate the Jews, two, he came to become the Paschal Lamb, three, he came to actually get the, the religious leaders that would never break a law to break all of their laws so that he could complete Fourthly, Passover. All that was portrayed in Passover, Jesus completed it as he was here that week. So many things came together that week during Passover, a Feast of the Unleavened Bread, and Feast of First Fruits. So as we're beginning today, I want you to think about something. You know, look in your scriptures, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Look at the part of the Gospels where Jesus entered Jerusalem that last week. And what you're going to find is a third to a fourth of each of the Gospels are written on the last weeks of Jesus' life, the week of his crucifixion and the week and the time until his uh, ascension back into heaven. So we see that. Why is that? Well, one reason could be because when you go to a funeral, you know, if a person's 80 years old, you hear more in the funeral about their last few years than you do of all of their early years put together. People's minds are just geared to remember the time that they spent. You, so you're not expecting to be telling Jesus' story from the time he was born to the time he started ministry. You're not even expecting to hear all about his ministry, but you're expecting the last part that is the most important, and that would have been this last week's of his life up until his ascension. Secondly, it could be that Jesus, knowing full well, he was God, he knew what was coming, he knew that was, this was going to be his last week, so Jesus incorporated into this last week some of the very most important things that he had to get across to his disciples and ultimately to you and me that he was trying to get across for us to learn to be able to implement Christianity as he would die, uh, be raised from the dead, ascend back to heaven, and he's, he would empower us to become his church. A third reason was that Jesus had to fulfill the prophecies. And this is very, very vitally important, as Jesus perfectly fulfilled every prophecy about him. If you read about those, especially from the book of Isaiah, he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we were healed. If you read from Psalm 22, it goes through, and many of the sayings that Jesus actually said on the cross are quoted from Psalm uh, 22. But it's ironic that each year priests would raise the Paschal lambs. We want to park on this just a minute. I want to go through some of these things, detail them out just a little bit more. Uh, lambs came from Bethlehem. You remember where Jesus was born? And they were raised for one particular purpose. All the way back to the time of Moses, we find that God instituted a Passover. Passover was the deliverance of the Hebrews from the Egyptians. But we find that the feast that God instituted was to kill and to eat a lamb. Now, when we get out into the wilderness, God instituted this more fully. And every year, the people were to, as they went into Israel, the people were to gather for three feasts. One of those was Passover. And during this feast of Passover, all of the, the things looked towards a Messiah coming. They would, they would raise a Paschal lamb that had to be spotless and unblemished. 
and several of those lambs were raised at one time because not if one of them was spotted in any way it it had to it couldn't be used as the lamb for sacrifice and that those lambs would be put out for public inspection for the week one of them would be chosen and every year one of those lambs would give its life and it would cover the sins of the people for the year. The priest would offer this lamb as a sacrifice. He would take some of the blood through the outer court, inner court, up to the Holy of Holies, behind the veil once a year with something even tied to his leg so that if he went in and didn't come out, uh, nobody could go in there but this one priest, and they would have to pull him out. And in there, he would sprinkle some of the blood over the mercy seat so that the sins of the nation for the year could be covered. But we have to understand that any blemish whatsoever would disqualify that lamb because a blemish represented sin. It, it represented imperfection and what would stand for the sins of the people had to be without any kind of imperfection. And that's why Jesus was going to be born into this world to live a sinless life. All mankind is born in this world with sin. John, or Romans 3.23 says, All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. From the time of Adam, everyone born through Adam and Eve, that's all of us, not any of us are excluded on this earth. All of us are born into sin. Take a two-year-old and ask him if he broke something. When you go around the corner and you see glass shattered in the room, the first thing he says, No, it wasn't me. Who taught your two-year-old to lie? We are born with a sinful nature. So only, only a, a man that is born through Adam can stand for somebody for the rest of us. Now, this is something that through most of history in most countries is, is a truth, is that if somebody is sentenced to be executed, someone that's innocent can come and say, I want, to, I want to take their punishment, and they can stand in for them. But in this case, because the sin came through Adam and Eve, only a human could do that. The problem is that in God's eyes, no human could be born into this world apart from sin, so all of us are disqualified. Nobody could do that. Nowhere in history would that be able to take place. So in God's perfect love, even from the very beginning, before this world was created, God in eternity, who looks down on time and is able to see all that is going to take place, He knew what was going to happen. He knew Adam and Eve were going to sin and forfeit their power and dominion that had been given to them. But God so loved the world that in the fullness of time he was going to send his own son to earth. Now, what did that do? Through the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus would be born through a virgin, Mary. This was 2,000 years ago. And by being born through a virgin, uh, Jesus would be born out of a human flesh. He would carry human flesh, and he could fully fulfill this as a man. If he could live a sinless life, but being born through a virgin and living in human flesh, how is he going to do that? The only way was he had to also be 100% uh, divine. And so God's Holy Spirit birth did, did the male part, and that was through the conception, and what that allowed was Jesus had to be 100% man, but at the same time he could be 100% God, and he could withstand all of sin. He could live above sin. He had power over sin. So scripture says, as one man brought sin into the world, that was Adam, only one could offer and become this sacrifice, and that would be Jesus. So we see that Jesus' job there, and we, we see another thing that Jesus had to do, because he, Jesus was uh, came at a time where all of these religious leaders, took a whole lesson on this, would never ever break a law. They would never, ever do anything wrong. In fact, this had to be done at a time of, of Passover, which was the most inopportune time for their entire year. Their whole focus was on bringing Passover to the city of Jerusalem, which really represented the entire nation. But Jesus had to so antagonize these religious leaders. 
pointing out what they were doing wrong in God's eyes and making them to feel threatened to the degree that right before this holy feast, they would do everything they could to see that he was put to, to death. You see, only a priest could offer the sacrifice, so that's why uh, in this we saw in another message that the priest were the ones literally that paid the protesters out in the, out in the courtyard to say, crucify him, crucify him, and even when Pilate was going to turn him loose, we find that Jesus was put to death by the priestly system that had made the decision. How was he going to get them to break the rules? 1,500 years of, of not only the rules that God gave them, but now man had interpreted how to, how to do these rules. You can't, uh, you can't walk through a cornfield and pick an ear of corn without breaking the law of the Sabbath, which was God's law, but man's rule applied to it. Said that you can't walk over a certain distance without breaking a, God's law or breaking a rule, and that was God's law uh, with an application of man's law applied to it. So, so all of that was heaped on top, and these priests prided themselves that they wouldn't do any of that. Jesus had to antagonize them so much that they would break all of the rules, and we find if we, if we would take exactly what happened, the time of Jesus' trial and his crucifixion, that some 15 laws of the Jews were broken by these priests so that Jesus through all of this would continue to be sinless and it was the priests and the leaders of the city at that time that were guilty. But still we find that Jesus laid his life down. No, nobody took Jesus' life. Literally, he laid his life down for you and me at any time. He could have called ten thousands of angels. You know it as you think back, when Jesus first appeared on the scene and he went to be baptized by John the Baptist, John the Baptist looked at Jesus and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So from the time of Adam to Moses, sacrifice was instituted when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden because God killed animals and made skins that covered them. And so for a person, sacrifices had to be made all the way up until the time of Moses. And then we find when, when the families had to escape Egypt during the time of deliverance and after the plagues, you, you read about the Ten Commandments, that first Passover, each family offered a lamb, which was which was the sacrifice for the family. And now the blood didn't just cover a person, but the lamb covered the sins of a family. And then as they went out into the wilderness, we find for 1,500 more years that God instituted the, the uh, festival of Passover or observance of Passover. And during that time every year, that lamb would be offered and that lamb would cover the sins again of a whole nation. But now we come up into the time of Jesus and we find that when Jesus was crucified on the cross, when he offered himself as a Paschal lamb for the very first time, the sins of the, of the world, not just the sins of a nation, but the sins of the world were washed away. That's the power of Passover. That's the power of what happened through that time of crucifixion, of death, burial, and resurrection of our Savior. Paul understands it, and in Romans 5, he said that through Adam's sin, all became guilty of sin, but through Jesus' obedience to God's plan, all became righteous. So what's your point this morning, Brother Sheldon? What opened the tomb and what that tomb opened for you and me? So let's get right into it and pray. And we'll jump into our message this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, I am so inadequate for what I do as I stand before people. And yet you give me, you give me messages. You reveal more about Easter than just about any other 
part of scripture and I'm asking you that as I'm sharing this morning that you will you will just spark things in people's hearts you will spark things in their minds and the very victory that Easter has brought the resurrection has brought that victory father let us take hold of it and claim it into who we are today I pray in Jesus name so this was part of what God engineered to bring Jesus to earth at a time that he did and weave Jesus into history and a place at that time where God's best of the day actually would accuse Jesus of trumped up charges. That's the priest and the Sadducees and the and the Pharisees, that, that was God's best. And, and they, they trumped up these charges against Jesus and that he committed crimes worthy of execution on their Sabbath or just before the Sabbath on a year called Passover so that every jot and tittle of God's plan could be fulfilled. Over three and a half years' time, Jesus accumulates small groups of followers. First, he had uh, 12 men that he chose as disciples. And then you see at other times that that group has grown that follow him, I guess, pretty consistently. And you hear about 70 people that are following Jesus. And now he rides into the city this last Passover that he's going to spend with his disciples. And the whole city of people are hailing him as king. Hosanna! Hosanna to the highest! King, hail to the king! And they they acknowledge him as the king. So on this very day, the priest would place those lambs. That was Palm Sunday, and that was the day that the priest would bring the, the lambs into the city. They were hailing Jesus as king. And so the priest would bring these lambs in and put them up for public inspection. And we see that through this week, Jesus was going to be also put up for public inspection. You know, during that time, it was ch children would make their way and they would point at these cages and they would say that, wonder if he's going to pick this one or this one or this one. Which one is going to be the sacrifice for the year? And at the very same time, we find that that these religious leaders, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Zealots, the Herodians, all of them came with questions trying to trip and to trap Jesus. So if any of those questions could have thrown him, they could have accused him of a crime worthy of execution back at that time. But in every case, God spoke through the heart of Jesus, speaking not just the law of God, but the heart of God. Did you ever think that there's two different ways of looking at each law? One is the law, and so many of us humans get hung up on the letter of the law instead of the heart of God in the law. God wants to protect us. He, just like a parent, that he instituted rules on this earth, and we have rules in our houses for our children as they grow up, so those children won't get hurt. So they, so they will live healthy, productive lives, and they'll become all that they were meant to be. And if you read the laws of God and understand them from the heart of God, you would see that also. So anyway, they come to him and they say, who are we going to serve? One group, Caesar or God? And Jesus answered questions uh, like, Sir, given to Caesar, what's Caesar's? And given to God, what's God's? They come asking, who, if a woman is married to seven different men, whose will she be in heaven? People that didn't even believe in heaven. Jesus again answered in, by, the, by the heart of God, in heaven there is no marriage given at all. Don't you know that? Others came trying to trick him, the Pharisees, asking what's the greatest commandment. Jesus went back to the heart of God in Deuteronomy 6, 5, <clears throat> saying that you will love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then he added a second commandment, and a new commandment is given to you, and it's to love your neighbor as yourself. And he said, on all of this hang the laws and the prophets. So today we would call all of those trivial questions, but at that time they were those things that hinged on the very basis of the faith of that nation, and Jesus could have been executed for giving a wrong answer. But just as the Pascal lamb, Jesus now had passed 
all of the tests. Jesus is going to go to the upper room with his disciples and to serve and observe a Passover with them a day early so that he could become the Paschal Lamb on the next day just before Passover is observed. During the discourses that occurred in those that upper room and now the the observance of Passover you can go to a Jewish Messianic Jewish or Christian Passover service they call them a Seder service and you can see exactly the same format that Jesus would have followed that night but also if you read John 14 15 16 and 17 you'll see the discourse that Jesus is going through with his disciples during that time instructing them about his leaving earth and how important it is for him to leave so that he could send the Holy Spirit back to earth to empower his believers. They didn't understand what it was about until after all of this had taken place. Then he made his way out to the garden, the olive garden. And while his disciples, full of food, only wanted to sleep, Jesus took Peter and James and John just a little further as he went ahead and cried out that agonizing prayer in the garden. I want to come this morning to this place of focusing on and thinking about for a minute what happened in that garden. You know, it's important to know what crime Jesus was paying for. Have you ever thought about that? When Adam and Eve in the garden yielded to the sin of Satan, literally God said in uh, Genesis 1.27 that he had created man and woman on this earth to give them the dominion over everything on this earth. In other words, he created this earth and he, uh, he gave us, delegated us the authority to run his business down here. And it's very simple. He gave us that authority. But when we sinned, the thing that happened when Adam and Eve did that, they, they handed that authority over to Satan. And you say, that's a little stretch, isn't it? No. Well, listen to this. When Satan took Jesus, when Jesus was on the scene and born, and now he's starting his ministry, he went out into the wilderness 40 days, and Satan tempted him three times. You remember that. And one of the times he took him up to a high place, showed him the kingdom of the world, kingdoms, and said, if you'll but fall down and worship me, I'll give you the authority and dominion over these kingdoms. Okay, my question is, if it was given to Adam and Eve in the garden, how did they lose it and how did Satan get it? It was through that sin. So that sin, the name of that sin is treason. If you go to any country in the history of the world, every time that sin is committed, it's punishable by death. So death came upon us, not just sin. We're not just born into sin, but the sentence of death. And if Jesus didn't go through with this, Talk about the darkest three days in history, but we would be going through them because there would be no hope for us at any point. You could offer all the sacrifices you want to and cover sins day by day and week by week and year by year, but at the end, when we died and stood before an Almighty God, nothing permanent had been done, and that would cause us to be separated from God forever and ever and ever. We'll never know the consequences of what it seems like the slightest sin, the slightest giving over to the voice that says to us, hath God said. But many people here on this earth have yielded to that voice. They've yielded to that sin and they've literally lost their eternity with God because they've, they've gotten into a place where they've never been able to find their way back and given their lives to Christ. But that sin is called treason. And treason is punishable by execution. And so that's why Jesus had to step from eternity into time, be born of a woman, live a, a sinless life for 33 and a half years so that he could become the Paschal Lamb and step into that place. And that when he did that, then forevermore, sins were no more covered, but they were paid for 100% and they were taken away. I don't know if you ever ask a question I ask. The question is, why didn't God just destroy this place down here? We sinned. He could have destroyed it and created a whole new one, another Adam and Eve. 
Well, the answer is that we don't understand God well enough. We don't understand the character of God because part of the character of God is perfect love. And perfect love created us and loves us in the midst of our wrongs. He still loved us. That's why for God so loved the world. We, we read that, we quote that, but so many times we don't understand that. So the reason that God designed this whole plan, sending His Son to earth, the, the trials that He would go through, the, the uh, persecution He would go through, and the death that He would suffer for you and me, the pain, agonizing pain that He would go through was because of His great love for us, His children. So Jesus was out in this garden, and from eternity He could look down. He knew what He was going to go through. He knew the... The, the pain that he was going to suffer. He didn't want to do that any more than you or I would do that. He was fully human even though he was God. And because he was God, it didn't lessen his pain in any iota. He knew what he was going to suffer, and yet he did it for his love for you and me. So Jesus came. He lived that sinless life. And now this last week, he entered the Jewish scene to become our eternal Passover. He's inspected throughout this week. And if you notice, he entered some of the discourses this week throughout the week, not only to get the attention of religious leaders, but so infuriate them that they're going to execute him on a very inconvenient time for them. Jesus knows on Passover that he's going to be offered. So when the Thursday comes, he's, offering, he's issuing woes to these religious leaders. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Woe to you, you blind guides, you fools. Jesus calls them hypocrites seven different times during this, uh, during this stinging rebuke to the leadership of the nation. He called them serpents and vipers, which the Jews knew full well to be synonyms for demons of hell. In fact, he told them that they worked hard to make converts to Judaism that would make them two more foe, the children of hell, that they themselves were. And I don't know if you read through your four uh, Gospels and you've noticed what Jesus' job was that last week, or if we just skim over the top. But all of these intricate little parts are in what Jesus had to do. Was Jesus sinning during this time when he was saying, Woe to you, woe to you? No, <laughs> Jesus was agitating. That was one of the things that he had to accomplish that week. There was another big hurdle. Jesus had been obedient to God all of his life. He had been the perfect son. He had followed the perfect plan. And now he was in this week where all of these pieces had to come together. He had to set the stage of a divine plan this week that no living person will know the full scope of, the full uh, plan that was in place before we get into eternity and God can show us. But love had another hurdle because Jesus is now fully aware of what we call pain. Jesus had seen from eternity the pain that he was going through. As we mentioned a minute ago, Jesus was going to have to suffer that. He knew the pain that he would suffer. But if there's anything worse than that pain, this would have been it. Can you say there might have been something worse this was going to be it. Jesus knew as he looked down on that time, for the first time in all of history, his father was going to have to turn his back on his own son. Jesus, who had never been separated from God in all of eternity, was going to find God turning his back on him for this thing that he was going to have to go through. What a terrible time that was going to be. Jesus if anything would have made him turn away from going through this, it would, have been, it would have been that. Jesus, on that Thursday night, gathered his disciples together to observe Passover a day early. Passover is divided into sections. And I would encourage you, if you've never done that, to have 
to go to some place where there's a, a teaching of Passover or you can go to a feast, whether it's Messianic or Christian feast. I'd love to come to churches and be able to present this. You can do it at any time of the year, and it's so, uh, it's, it's so encouraging and it's structural to help us understand the fullness of the season of, that we go through this time of year, the Resurrection Sunday. So, so of the three pieces of matzah on the table in the unity representing the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, it's the middle one that's brought out, it's striped, it's pierced, it's broken, a fulfillment of Scripture right before us. Jesus would have broken that in front of His disciples, put it in a napkin which represented grave cloth. He would have put it under the table. They would have gone through this thing where they have four different, one cup, but they pour it four different times. Each one has a different name. The cup of judgment, the cup of sanctification, the cup of, of redemption, the cup of blessing. And as they go through those, uh, each one has a special prayer that is said. So they go through part of this, through all of the telling of the story of the Exodus, and then they would have a full meal. And after the meal is where we come back, and the part that we know is the Lord's Supper, our communion is taken of that, where Jesus pulls this Alpha Coman, saying, He is come out from under the table, and He unfolds it in front of His disciples, and He holds it. It's broken, pierced, and striped. He breaks it again and hands it to His disciples, and He said, This is my body that is broken for you. What you've done as Jews for the last 1,500 years, it represents what's going to happen in the next few hours. And then He takes the cup, the cup of redemption. It's poured, and a blessing is said over it. Uh, and, and that blessing says, Blessed are you, O God, creator of the fr fruit of the vine, uh, God of this universe, who redeems us with outstretched arms. It was going to be Jesus who put his arms out and redeems us on the cross of Calvary just in the, in the hours ahead. At some dis uh, discourse and teaching, and we find that Apart from the Passover service in John 14, 15, and 16, Jesus is telling of the necessity of what was going to be happen. Jesus was saying that he, he had to go through this. It was expedient, necessary. He says, I'm going to be sending you guys out all across to the ends of the earth with the gospel message. He says, I can't go with you, so I'm going back to heaven where I can send the Holy Spirit to birth the church, and that will allow the Holy Spirit to fully, uh, to fully live my life through you. That is ultimately what is going on. But Jesus comes to that place in the garden where all of this is in His mind. He knows it all. He knows the end from the beginning of what is going to happen in the hours to come. And we have to know that Jesus went into that garden with the ability of making a choice. Jesus could have turned away from His mission. That's why God made us with three choices because He wants us to love Him. He wants us to serve Him. He wants us to submit our lives to Him. But He gives us a choice to do that. And many people want a fire escape policy. They want to escape hell, but they're not willing to become His disciples. They're not willing to surrender to His plan. They're not willing to make Him Lord. We want Him as Savior, but we are not willing to make Him Lord. Paul said it best, While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Only one man was sacrificed for the good of every living man. And that man was... His name was Judas. No Mussolini, no Hitler, no axe murderer, no drug dealer, prostitute, no addict of any kind, no child molester. None of those escapes the great love that Jesus had that night in that garden for all of mankind that has ever lived. Scripture says it's not God's will that any, not any, perish or be lost, no matter who they are, no matter what His name is. His love for you, His love for you, just where you are, is what compelled Him to go through one of the worst tortures ever known to man by the beating of the Romans, then that worst death of execution to take your punishment and redeem you to 
to the Father. Even if you had never had a good father on earth, even if you don't know what a good father-son or father-daughter relationship is about, there is something on the inside of us that knows the perfection that God could offer you or me if we didn't have that as an example here on earth. Thank God Jesus said yes. This is a good time of the year that I would suggest you watch The Passion of the Christ again to get a glimpse of what Jesus actually went through, His suffering for you and me during that, those hours. The religious leaders would find Him in the garden and arrest Him, and He would be willing to go with them. They would beat him beyond recognition by the next morning. The Pharisees would break some of 15 of their own laws to hold court at night, not invite a full representation of the Sanhedrin, and not wait past the religious feast day or the prescribed three days required before you sentence someone and before you execute someone. God planned all of this so Jesus could walk out in front of Pilate at 9 o'clock the next morning at exactly the same time as the priest would go to choose the lamb that was going to be spotless and unblemished. And both would pronounce the sentence of death on these. And that sentence was, I find no fault with this one. As Pilate washed his hands and the crowd said, crucify him, crucify him. They impelled Pilate to turn him back over to those people who would take him out uh, under, the, under the Romans, of course, but take him up to the hill of Golgotha where he would be crucified. His great love extended through time for you, <clears throat> whoever you are listening and watching this morning. He went to that cross willingly at three o'clock in the afternoon after the sky had become dark three hours after the Father had turned his back on Jesus. Jesus cried out. He said, it is finished. And then he cried out, into the hands I commend my spirit. And Jesus on that cross died a death carrying the sins of the world. He carried your sins and my sins. That year at three o'clock, there was a cry that shook heaven and earth. And that cry came from our Savior, our Messiah, Jesus Christ. Jesus died. He was hurriedly taken down and buried before dark. And a garrison of Roman soldiers, whose very lives depended upon their alertness and not letting anything slip through them, were on duty outside. Meanwhile, Jesus' followers spent three of the darkest days that the earth has ever experienced. They knew by now that there is a war between good and evil, a Satan that always fights the will of God and his legions of demons that are always after the souls of every man, woman, and child on the face of this earth. They didn't understand yet how God's plan would play out, but they were certain Jesus was the Messiah. And he went through this horrid week of events that Satan had carefully launched his assault from Sunday when representatives hailed him as king. Friday, a hired mob had demanded his execution and crucifixion. And now God's plan seemed thwarted. How could it have happened? In their eyes, the hope of humanity was destroyed. It was gone. Now they were without a leader. But friends, the good news is there's a Sunday coming. Can you say with me, there's a Sunday coming? Early on Sunday, a garrison of soldiers were blinded by a light of the glory of God. And his angels rolled a stone away weighing up to two tons, 4,000 pounds, to show the world <clears throat> that Jesus had arisen from the dead, defeated death, hell, and the grave for you and me, and that all that would trust in Jesus and invite Him into their lives. The signature of true faith over all the other imposters of the world is that we, we have a Savior that came, that, that, and there's an empty tomb the love of an almighty God that sent the God of glory to live humbly on this earth, to be rejected, ridiculed, 
tortured and crucified. The love of a father that made it possible for your sins not to be covered, but to be eternally washed away today. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, it's the love of a father who sees through who you are for what you were designed to be. I believe that on the inside of each of us is a spiritual DNA akin to the physical DNA you know about, but the spiritual DNA is God's purpose and plan designed for your life, and He knows what you're supposed to be doing. He knows what you're capable of. He knows all of that. And He's calling you to Himself. He's inviting you this morning, knocking on your door. Will you accept His knock this morning? Will you accept what He's offering you this morning? You say, how can I do that, Brother Sheldon? Well, it's simply by praying a prayer. And you say, I don't even know how to pray. I don't know what to do. And I'm going to say, well, let me offer some words that you can pray along with me. But this can't be my prayer. It has to be your prayer. If you feel this morning a conviction, a knocking and tugging by the Holy Spirit in your life, if you can never go back to a place that you pray to prayer, asking forgiveness of your sins and surrendering your life to Jesus and seeing a change take place in your life, then I invite you to pray along with me today. Could I do that? Could I offer you this gift this morning? And the prayer would go something like this. Oh God, I know that I'm a sinner and I can't save myself. I've tried to find you. I've looked in so many places here on this earth to find what's meaningful, what's real. And, and I, I'm believing that that's you. But I don't know how to find you. However, today, I believe for the first time that you can reach down and find me. I believe that Jesus was your son that you sent to earth, and he lived, he was born through a virgin Mary 2,000 years ago. I believe Jesus lived those 33 years, and he lived a sinless life so that he could die as the Paschal Lamb. He could die in my place. He could be crucified on that cross and die to carry my sins. I believe Jesus was buried, that he arose three days later to defeat death, hell, and the grave for me. And I believe that Jesus, after being seen of some 500 witnesses, as is recorded in history, ascended before some of his followers back into heaven where he sits at the right hand of the Father making intercession for you and for me this very day. I believe that, but I understand that's not what saves me. That's not what, that's not what brings me into your kingdom. This is what's different, and I want to come doing this today, Lord. Please forgive me for my sins. I recognize that I'm a sinner and I can't save myself. I recognize that I'm fallen. I'm separated from you. Please forgive me of all of my sins, Lord. Please come and live your life through me. I surrender whatever there is in my life that I can still give you. I, I give it all to you right now. I surrender my life to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Thank you, Lord. Now I want to thank you because according to the Bible, that's what I needed to do. I thank you for just saving me. I thank you for writing my name in your eternal book so that when I come to heaven, you will say, enter in, you are mine. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hallelujah. Now, you need to let somebody know what you have just done, the, the, the prayer that you just prayed. The old devil's going to try over the next few weeks to tell you those were just words, didn't mean anything. But listen, you're going to go through the same stuff that you've always gone through, and you're not going to respond the same anymore because God's birthed something brand new on the inside of you, but you've got to protect what He's doing. Now, how do you do that? Three things quickly. One is you learn to talk to God. Just spend time talking to Him. He already knows everything about you, every thought you think. He knows it all. Don't hide anything. Just begin to talk to Him. Become His best friend. He wants to become your best friend. Then you want to learn more about Him, and, and you learn that by reading the Bible. That, that's, 
that's re his revelation. It's his love letter to you and his revelation about who he is to this earth. And you would begin with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's the Gospels that talk about the life of Jesus. And then go back and just read it cover to cover. You don't just read it once. You read it over and over and over and over. You fall in love with God. You'll fall in love with His Scripture. And then you need to grow and be mentored and discipled in this new walk. You've got to protect what God's doing. So find a church home. Don't just visit any church. You pray first and ask God to lead you, and He, and he will. And then He will plug you into a church. Visit several. Let Him show you which one that you're to be a part of. And then as you become a part of that church, you can give to that church, but you can also receive from that church. And if there's others out there this morning that you know that you have uh, accepted Jesus at some point in your life, but you're not living for Him, let me just offer a prayer for you. And it would go something, Father, in Jesus' name, I realize that I have given my life to you, but I'm just not living up to your standard. And I have no idea what your purpose and plan is for my life. I've sat on the throne of my life, and I've never let you come to sit in that throne. I made you the Savior, but I've never allowed you to be Lord. I'm asking your forgiveness today. Forgive me of all of my sins, everything that I've done wrong and everything I was supposed to do that I didn't do. Please forgive me today, Lord. I'm asking you to come now. I, I surrender my life to you. I let you come and sit on the throne of my life. I'm going to surrender to you and to your will. Help me, Lord, and direct me to know what it is you want me to do. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Now, I think everybody's mind and heart is clear. I just want to say thank you for the absolute privilege of sharing this with you on this most important, uh, powerful week of the year as we're looking towards what Jesus did during that passion time to make it possible for us to live eternally with Him and our Father in heaven. God bless you, and you have a great week.